الله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين so طيب يا اخوان we started last week talking about some of the poisons of the heart the matters that can cause disease in the heart because we said that the process of purifying the heart is twofold and the first part is to remove all of those factors which cause diseases in it and then the second um, phase is to treat the heart with those things which can cure it and bring about its purity so we mentioned last week from the poisons of the heart from the disease causers in the heart we mentioned al dhunub sins. And so today, inshallah ta'ala, we'll continue in that vein, discussing another um, poison, another disease of the heart. And today that disease is the disease of ignorance, al-jahl. And this is a very dangerous disease, and a disease which afflicts, uh, unfortunately, many Muslims. And because of it, um, their hearts um, have become diseased. And because of the danger of this poison, of this disease causer, the Prophet ﷺ, he used to stress and emphasize and encourage the Muslims to do the opposite, or to try to <coughs> eradicate their jahl by way of gaining knowledge. As he said in the hadith collected by Ibn Majah on the authority of Anas, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ Seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every Muslim. So it is required for every Muslim to seek knowledge. And this is specifically, this is general, it's comprehensive, it's all-encompassing, but it's even more, it's something we should stress and emphasize even more, for al misa for women. Because women tend to be uh, neglected, they tend to get ignored in Islamic communities. And as a result, their ignorance is usually greater than the ignorance of, of men. The opportunities afforded to women to learn uh, are limited, usually. And even when opportunities are presented, their attendance is usually poor. And when they don't get taught from the mosque, for example, and their men come to the mosque and study but don't go home and teach them, then they will be ignorant. And the, this ignorance then becomes what? It becomes transmitted to what? To our young people. We have to understand the critical nature of women being knowledgeable because they are the first teachers of our young people. As the poet, he said, إِذَا النِّسَاء نَشَأْنَ فِي أُمِّيَّةٍ رَضِيَ الرِّجَالُ خَمُولَةً وَجَهُولًا So the poet, he said, if women are raised up in ignorance, then they will breastfeed, they will cause, they will make the children inherit khamulan wa jahula, laziness, ineptitude, and ignorance. And this is real, wallahi ya khwani, this is what we see in the Muslim Ummah. We see women who don't know anything about deen, they do a lot of things that contradict the deen, and we see children who by default, by consequence, do the same thing. And then you have a bunch of old men who know something about the deen, who come to the mosque, who pray, and know something about the deen. But their women are ignorant, and their children are growing up ignorant. And this is a society where you don't have any help. It's not like back home, where people can pick things up from here and minhuna wa They can pick it up from here and there because it's a, it's a Muslim society. But in America, all they pick up is what? nonsense and falsehood, they're bombarded by it. So there has to be an effort to want to teach and to learn. And so what I want to do, because this poison is specifically very, very sensitive, very critical, especially in the society we live in, I want to mention to you the danger of ignorance. Why this is so important, why we have to emphasize knowledge, the opposite of ignorance. And so I'll mention to you a few dangers or potential hazards posed by ignorance. The first one is the ignorant person, Yahwani, has the potential, because of his ignorance, 
to cause harm to himself. He can actually inflict harm on himself because of his ignorance. And this is evidenced by the famous hadith of Abi Sa'id al Khudri, of Abu Bukhari, Muslim, in which the Prophet narrated the story of the man who killed 99 people. And in that hadith, he mentioned, he said, كَانَ فِي مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ رَجُلٌ قَتَلَ تِسْعَةً مُتِسْعِينَ نَفْسًا فَسَالَ أَنْ أَعْلَمِ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَدُلْ عَلَى رَاهِبٍ So it says that the Prophet said that there was once a man from a previous nation and he had killed 99 people. And after doing so, he felt remorse, he wanted to repent, and so he asked to be guided to a scholar, the most knowledgeable person in the earth, and he asked to be guided because he wanted to know can I repent from all these murders? Can I repent from this? And if I repent, if, if I can repent, if it's something possible, how do I go about it? I don't know what to do. So how do I need someone to teach me how to repent? Fadullah ala rahim. Fadullah ala rahim. So he was guided to a, a monk. What is a monk? A monk is a person who has a lot of zeal, a lot of passion for deen. He devotes his life to deen. He divorces the dunya, but he has no real knowledge, and he's not qualified to give fatawa. So he was misdirected to what? Someone who appears knowledgeable, but in reality is ignorant. So when he went to that person, he went to him and he asked him and he said, he said, indeed a man has killed 99 people, can he repent? And so the monk said, La. He said, no way. A sinful wretch like you, there's no way Allah will forgive you after what you've done. And he answered out of what? Ignorance. This is jahl, ya khuan. There is no sin, not even the sin of shirk, that a person can't repent from if he what? If he still has air in his lungs, if he's still alive, if he's still living, he can what? He can repent. So what the monk said was ignorance. And as a result, what happened? He killed him. He got angry, he got upset, and he killed the monk and completed with him the killing of a hundred souls. So here we see the ignorance of the monk caused harm to himself. People can harm themselves because of their ignorance. On the other side of the coin, another danger of ignorance is that sometimes people, they don't, their harm or the harm of their ignorance isn't limited, isn't restricted to themselves. But in fact, they end up harming other people. And we see this from the hadith, the hadith of Abu Dawood and others on the authority of Jabr ibn Abdullah, in which he said, خَرَجْنَا فِي سَفَرٍ فَأَصَابَ رَجُلًا مِنَّا حَجْرٌ فِي رأسي. He said, we went out on a journey, and on that journey a man from amongst us was struck in the head by a stone. And it caused what? It caused a huge gash, a wound in his head. And so, after that, he went to sleep in the evening, and he had a wet dream. He became sexually defiled, in need of what? Complete ghusl. فَسَأَلَ أَصْحَابَهُ فَقَالْ هَلْ تَجِدُونَ لِي رُخْسَةً فِي التَّيَمُّمْ He asked his companions, he said, Hey, do you think I can make tayammum under the circumstances? Because I have this huge wound and I'm afraid that if I make a complete bath, it'll open up, it'll bleed, and, you know, it won't be good. So they said, لَا لَا نَجِدُ لَكَ رُخْسَةً وَأَنْتَ تَقْدِرُ الْمَا He said, we don't, we don't see how you could possibly do that because water is available and you're able to use it. So he used the water, took a bath, and he ended up, that wound ended up opening up, it bled profusely, and he ended up bleeding to death. So then when they returned to al Medina, they told the Prophet what happened. And the Prophet became angry. And his anger was um, recognizable on his face. It could easily be you know, seen on his face. And then he said, listen to this, Yahwan. He said, Qatalu, Qatalahu Allah. He said they killed him. He made them responsible for his death. Then he prayed against them. Think about this. This is the prophet of mercy and the one whose dua is answered. And he prays against them. He says, Allah. May Allah kill them. Then he said, he said, 
ala sa'alu illam ya'lamu why did they just ask if they didn't know fa inna shifa'ul ghi a su'al for indeed the cure for ignorance is to what to ask the people who know so the point is is that if you look in this hadith you see that the man's ignorance or the people's ignorance didn't just hurt them it in fact it what it hurt others and so sometimes in khwan of our ignorance we can actually cause harm to other people. So that tells you another danger of ignorance is sometimes we don't just hurt ourselves, but we hurt others as well. Another... Uh, Back up, huh? Like, <laughs> I'm worried for you. I learned from the Prophet. <laughs> Allah is a Allah is a The third uh, danger that I want to mention, Ya Khwam, is that one of the things that is despised in the deen is khilaf. One of the things that's despised in the deen is these differences of opinion, these disputes which lead to schism, which lead to division. And this is something hated by Allah, hated by the Prophet. We can see this from a number of angles. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about um, the opposite of khilaf and the opposite of schism, he talks about unity. And he calls it a ni'mah. He says, وَعْتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تُفَرَّقُوا So he ordered the Muslims, he said, hold fast. He ordered them with unity. And then he prohibited them from division. He said, hold fast to the rope of Allah altogether and do not be divided. Then he says, وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّغَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ So he says, and remember the ni'mah of Allah. That this unity he called it what? A ni'mah. Called a ni'mah, a bounty, a favor from Allah. So this tells you the virtue of it. But the opposite, he said about the opposite, he said, وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمْ رَبُّكَ He says, and they will not cease to what? To differ amongst themselves. Except the people to whom your Lord has shown mercy. mercy which means that he loves what? He loves that you don't differ. And the people who differ are the people who have been deprived of Allah's mercy. So this khilaf is something despised by Allah, despised by His Messenger, and something that they warned against. And one of the root causes of al khilaf is what? Al-Jahl. Ignorance. That people start to dispute because they don't know the haqq. And so they're what? They're calling to, they're defending, they're advancing, they're promoting falsehood. And that's what Ibn Ahmad used to say. He used to say, إِنَّمَا جَاءَ خِلَافُ مَنْ خَالَفْ لِقِلَّةِ مَعْرِفَتِهِ بِمَا جَاءَ عَنَ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم He said the disputing and differing of the one who disputed is seldom caused by anything other than his lack of knowledge of what the Prophet ﷺ came with. When people start differing, usually amongst them are people who are advancing something which is not the Sunnah. And they insist this is the right thing, and they think it's the right thing. But in fact, it's the wrong thing. And they think it's the right thing out of ignorance. Another danger, another danger of ignorance, Ya Khwam, is that ignorance is the principal cause of the most heinous crime in the deen after a shirk. What's the most heinous crime in the deen after a shirk? Al bid'ah. Al bid'ah. The most heinous crime is that you bring something into Allah's deen that He didn't that he didn't authorize. And you bring it into the deen. So when you bring it into the deen, you're saying it's what? A part of the deen. And then you're doing what? You're lying on Allah. You're lying on Allah. That's why this is more heinous than drinking wine. People, for example, people in the mosque, and they're doing some weird dhikr that the Prophet didn't authorize. And some very religious and knowledgeable person will come and, and, and scold them. I say, why are you doing this? You shouldn't do this. And they'll say, get out of here. Go, there's ten Muslims in the bar down the street. You want to call to good and forbid evil? Then go and get those Muslims out of the bar. They're the ones who are sinning. We're in the mosque. We're in the house of Allah. Leave us alone. La. You're doing what? A greater sin. Because the people in the bar, if I ask them, is khamr halal? They'll say, what? No, it's haram. We're sinners. They'll admit that they're wrong. They won't attribute what they do to Allah or justify it. But the people who make this weird dhikr and associate partners with Allah, 
If you ask them, is this from the dean? They'll say, what? It's from the dean, Allah legislated it, authorized it. They're doing what? Lying on Allah. Araf to me, Ikhwan, this is, so one is clearly greater than the other one, although on the surface it looks like what these people are the people of good, these are people of the what? Of sin. Fayyid. So I'll just mention here regarding uh, the seriousness of this cause or how this in ignorance is a cause of innovation. The statement of Ibn Taymiyyah. So he says, وَلَا تَجْرُ أَحَدًا وَقَعَ فِي بِدْعَةٍ إِلَّا لِنَقْصِ اتِّبَاعِهِ لِلسُنَّةِ عِلْمًا وَعَمَلًا You will not find anyone who falls into innovation except him who lacks knowledge of the sunnah or simply fails to practice it. وَإِلَّا فَمَنْ كَانَ بِهَا عَالِمًا وَلَهَا مُتَّبِعًا لَمْ يَكُنْ عِنْدَهُ دَاعٍ إِلَى الْبِدْعَةِ فَإِنَّ الْبِدْعَةَ يَقَعُ فِيهَا الْجُبْحَالِ فِي السُنَّةِ he says, otherwise the one who knows the sunnah and follows it, there will be no reason for him to innovate. For indeed, innovation is only committed by those who are ignorant of the sunnah. If you know the sunnah, then you have no need to what? To innovate. Finally, well, I'll mention two really quickly. Another reason why this ignorance is dangerous, is that it's one of the principal obstacles to accepting the truth. We were created, except, were created yeah, to accept the truth and to follow it, to follow Allah's deen. And so we want to, we, what we should be keen to do, what we should want to do is remove every obstacle that will do what? Prevent us from what? Accepting the truth and following. And one of the principal obstacles to accepting the truth and following is ignorance. When you don't know the truth, it, you, can't, you can't follow it. So we need to understand that this ignorance is what? Is keeping us prevents us from following the truth, so we need to what? Eradicate our ignorance. As Ibn al-Qayyim, he said, وَالْأَسْبَابُ الْمَانِعَ مِنْ قُبُولِ الْحَقِّ كَثِيرَةٌ جِدَّةٌ فَمِنْهَا الْجَهْلُ فَمِنْهَا الْجَهْلُ بِهِ وَهَذَا السَّبَبُ هُوَ الْغَالِبُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِ النُّفُوسِ فَإِنَّ مَنْ جَهِلَ شَيْئًا عَادَاهُ وَعَادَ أَهْلَهُ He said, the matters which prevent people from accepting the truth are very numerous, and ignorance is one of them. This obstacle is the one which affects people more than any other because people have a tendency to hate what is foreign to them and the people who follow it. People hate the hate. I, I don't know that. I know that's something we do in my home back where I'm from. So they do what? They hate it and they hate the people who follow it and they end up hating, hating the truth without realizing it. And finally, Ikhwani, from the dangers of ignorance, is that ignorance is one of the principal causes of the religious extremism. And we live in a time where this is a big problem that the Muslims are suffering from. And it causes many far overarching, far reaching, and overarching um, perils for the Muslims. That a Muslim here in America, far away from all this conflict, goes to Walmart and gets mistreated because people associate him with what? With the imagery that they see, the images that they see on what? On CNN and Fox, etc. You're one of the people of ISO, you know, whatever. People go and they travel and they get stopped and put in that room, shaken down, their bags get, you know, torn through and they get asked a bunch of questions and interrogated like they're guilty until proven innocent. And this happens as a result of what? Religious extremism. People can't come to the country just to study. All they want to do is study and learn science and technology and medicine that will be beneficial to the people back home, but they can't do that because they're, you know, they get their passport stamped. They're, they're considered a, um, a person of suspicion, a person who could be linked to someone who could be linked to who, someone who could be linked to, etc. And you have people who've gone overseas and studied so that they could benefit and learn beneficial knowledge and bring it back here. And then those people go over there and then they get caught. They get caught at the, um, what do you call it, the, is immigration, I think. When immigration, they're coming, they're landing to go and study. And then they get sent back, deported, because of these fears that, well, you're from Yemen, you know, and there's, you know, issues with Yemen, or you came, yeah, Weren't you in Somalia once that you were in struggle? I'm, I'm from Somalia. Oh, really? And they get deported. Just because of the country that they 
originated from. You have a person with an American passport, but they were originally Somalian, let's say. And Somalia is considered a place where what, a hotbed for terrorism or whatever. And the point I'm trying to make is that this religious extremism has affected Muslims in so many ways and harmed Muslims in so many ways. And one of the root causes of this is what? Religious extremism. I'm sorry, uh, ignorance. <clears throat> and people become extremists because of their zeal, which is not bridled by knowledge. These are some of the most, these people who do the things that we see and we hear about are some of the most illiterate people when it comes to Islam. They're some of the most ignorant people when it comes to Islam. They have lots of zeal, but they're what? Some of the most ignorant people in the deen. So this ignorance is what causes what? Them to be extremists. Because if they had knowledge and zeal, that knowledge would do what? It would bridle the zeal, like a bridle for a horse, which what? It would reins it in and keeps it under what? Under control. And we see this throughout history, from the time of the companions up until now, that the Khawarij, they keep what? They come out and they do the things that they do and they get put down and then they do what? They resurface. Every time the head is cut off, two heads emerge. And they emerge what? Worse than the previous generation, the previous strain of, uh, of this type of religious extremism. And this goes throughout history from the time of the companions and the Tabi'een up until today. They've always described these people as people of what? Ignorance. People who are driven by their passions, which are not bridled by ignorance. So we have to be aware of this, Yahuani, be aware of these um, the danger of ignorance. It's one of the greatest poisons of the heart, and it's extremely dangerous to us in so many different ways, and we mentioned some of them. And I'll just recap that when we're ignorant, and think about this, not just in your own context, but in the context of what your family is, because we talked about this. Wives are not being taught, children are being taught. So think about this, not just in your own context, but the context of your families, that when you're ignorant, you can harm yourself. When you're ignorant, you can harm others. When you're ignorant, it can cause you to get into disputes, and you're in the wrong. You're in error, but you think you're right, because what? Because of your ignorance. It can also cause you to fall into what? Bid'ah, the most heinous crime in the deen after a shirk. And it can also cause you and cause some of our children who are very vulnerable, very gullible, very naive to fall into what? Religious extremism. And we've seen this. We've seen people get caught up because they had the zeal, but they didn't have the knowledge. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barat in Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'i. Yeah, Sheikh. Number one, number two, go on three. So, which one comes the first, you understand, the horse or the cart? What I mean by this, uh -huh. should we educate the people first or we unite them first? Ah, uh, should we unite them or educate them? Which one comes the first, you understand? Um, well, to be honest with you, if you have unity without education, you're not going to have unity. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ He says, hold fast. So he didn't just say, وَعْتَصِمُوا mm -hmm. He didn't say, تَوَحَّدُوا اِتَّحِدُوا mm -hmm. He didn't say, just be united, be one. Mm -hmm. He didn't say that. But rather he said, وَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ mm -hmm. So he wants them to unite on something. And he was specific. حَبْلِ mm -hmm. The rope of Allah. So he didn't say, Hibalillah. He didn't say the ropes of Allah. He said what? There's one rope. Mm -hmm. He wants them to unite mm -hmm. on that. And then he says, Wala And do not be divided. It's almost as if he said, if you hold fast to the rope of Allah, you won't be divided. divided. Mm -hmm. But if you don't hold fast to the rope of Allah, you will, mm -hmm. you will be divided. So it's as if he's telling us that this is the way to what? To, to be united. About to have real unity. And this is confirmed by the hadith of Irbab. And when the Prophet he said, Whoever lives long amongst you, he'll see much differing and disputation. So, he, this he, so he's, he's telling them about the disease. Mm -hmm. And this is the way of the Prophet. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you about the disease, but I'm also going to prescribe mm -hmm. the cure. I just won't leave you out there. There's this disease out there, and good luck with it. That's not the way of the Prophet. Here's the disease. Here's the cure. Mm -hmm. So he says, 
Sunnati. Sunnati. So follow my Sunnah. This is the way to get you out of what? The Khilaf. And the Sunnah of my rightly guided Caliphs after me. As if he says, my Sunnah and the Sunnah of my companions. Which is the best way to interpret because sometimes people's interpretation differs. So just so you can have the right interpretation, don't just confine yourself to the hadith because everybody follows the hadith, right? Mm -hmm. But he says, follow the hadith as understood by, by my companions because they, they know it the best. Mm -hmm. And he says, Tamasaku biha. Hold fast to it. Wa'abdu'ariha bin Which means what? This is an ishara. This is an allusion to what? Shadayat. That there's going to be all types of things pulling you up in all types of directions wanting you to leave what? Leave this path, this sunnah, holding fast to it. And one of those is what? The calls to what? Unity for the sake of unity. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, see. But, Sheikh, I'm you, sorry, Sheikh, eh, but, but you understand, uh -huh. like in a small city like this here in Colombia, eh, and instead of 500 people, 500 dollars, 500 <laughs> people <laughs> making <laughs> Eid prayer here and 200, you understand, it would be something so amazing for Colombia and the news channel, and you will see, it, you understand, two, three thousand dollars, uh, three thousand <laughs> people dollar. together at the same time, making, you understand, the Eid, and this is unity, you understand, and so... Idhar, Idhar, Hada Idhar, al This is, this is giving the impression Mm -hmm. Of unity, ah, I see. but their hearts are not united. And Allah warns against this in the Quran. He warns, hey, hey, see, and this is the thing. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala doesn't like. See, in this world, we get caught up in cosmetics. Mm. We like to look the part. Isn't that true? Yep. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has never taught us that in the Quran. And the Prophet never taught us in the Sunnah. But looking the part. It's like what? Be the part. Mm -hmm. Work your tail off to be the part. Even if it doesn't what? It doesn't look that good. Other people might not see it. Mm. But that's the reality. That's what matters. Mm. Not what people see, but the reality. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the Quran, He talks about the people who what? They look the part, but it's not real, and he criticizes them. He exposes them, and he threatens them. So look, 13, it starts the Quran, it tells us people are three types. It starts with the believers, handful of verses. Kufar, two verses. Why? I mean, it's clear. Then he comes to these people who like to what? Make it look one way. But the reality is something else. 13 verses. So you can recognize them. And more importantly you can what? Recognize this disease in yourself. The disease of what? Al-Nifaq. Then a whole surah. Exposing them. So again. You can recognize them. And you can recognize what the disease is. In yourself. So you can avoid it yourself. So we're not supposed to make the impression, and even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet said in the hadith, إن الله لا ينظر إلى أجسادكم ولا إلى أموالكم Doesn't look at your exteriors, doesn't look at how much money you have, بل يتضيع على قلوبكم وأعمالكم He looks at what's inside and your deeds. So we need to concern ourselves not with the idhaar of al-wihda, but we need to concern ourselves with asbab al-wihda. The things which will bring about al wihda and the Prophet told us, Allah told us, wa tasimu bi habl, lillah, hold fast rope. So we call to what? The rope of Allah. And the Prophet said, alaykum bi sunnati, follow my sunnah. So we call to the sunnah. And that doesn't mean that we can't make errors in our call. Sometimes we're too harsh. Sometimes we're not patient enough. Sometimes we're intolerant. So yeah, we can be called on that. We can be called on that. You Wahhabis, you Salafis, you're too harsh. But duly noted. You're too strict. You're too intolerant. You're not patient enough. But you can call us on that. 
But don't call us on what? On maybe the way we do it is wrong. Mm -hmm. But what we do is not wrong. Mm -hmm. We call to what? The rope of Allah, mm -hmm. which is the book of Allah. And we call to what? The sunnah. And those are the real means to what? To produce unity. Mm -hmm. oh, it's, it's very hard, Shia. It's very hard, you understand, because it will take a lot of time, you understand, but if we come all of us in Sisku Park or whatever park, we barbecue and all these women, all the children, this big unit, you understand, this, uh, this is something amazing, you understand, everybody will be talking about it, uh, you're talking to me, Hablullah and Rob of Allah, this is going to take years and years and maybe even we'll never accomplish it. You see me, uh, can uh, you find a, a different way? Well, um, what, what I'll say it's is nothing, this. Nothing that can be quick, that yeah, can, we can make it. Accelerate the process. Uh, yeah. Accelerate the process. Well, Mahi, um, I think the Muslims, uh, they have a tendency, most people, I won't blame just on the Muslims, but most people, they want instant gratification. They want instant gratification. And I don't think that that happens in, in matters like this. Mm. You don't get instant gratification. You have to work. A lot of us sober, inshallah. They have to work, yeah. Zakallah. Yeah. Barakallah. You're done. Our brothers, the floor is open, brothers. <laughs> floor is open. <laughs> any ahead. questions, any comments, any complaints, yeah, Juan? Any critiques? No, no complaint, brother. No complaint. We try to understand, yeah, okay. because we've been trying to get this so-called unity, but it seems like okay. only understand the same number of people, Eight, eighty things like yeah. this, but you understand if we can go and get all this message down for Salat al Eid yeah. and start around at least once a year, at least once a year. Yeah. Okay, come on. Well, uh, what I, like I said, and I'll, I'll, I'll admit this because um, I hear this a lot. I think if if anything, if there's any legitimate criticism, the legitimate criticism is sometimes because we love the truth, we love the sunnah, we love the deen, we love the way of the son of a saleh. Sometimes our approach is a little abrasive and it kind of, it pushes people away. So we kind of need to be a little bit more gentle, a little more tolerant. But as far as what we call to and what we insist on, we insist that people want, they follow the deen, they avoid bid'ah, etc. This is the right thing. Maybe the way we go about it is wrong, but what we're doing is the right thing. Maybe maybe a sheikh because he's just in you in town, you don't know what's going on, maybe we'll ask another <laughs> sheikh can get us a fatwa to understand, get the Muslim. That sounds thing. fair, because you know I'm you know, I definitely new. I'm brand new. <laughs> but I've been around. I've been around. I've been a square. <laughs> <laughs> so Go ahead, brother Wasim, get your question, man. You got a question, Brother Wasim? Just uh, on the subject, uh, just how do I mean, we come and come and yeah? How do we attract the people though? Like there, there, there are so many things being done to attract people to the other side, right? And this is critical, you know. Like how, how can we get them to come to us? Well, Lahi, I think um, a lot of things that are being done, they're they're, they're working. And I'll give you a perfect example. Um, the Eliza, uh, yes. Um, the, 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 the Quran Madrasa on Wednesdays and Saturdays. I mean, I've, I've come on Wednesdays and Saturdays, I can't find a parking spot. And um, I come into the mosque and it's full of people. And it's, you know, it's men, women, and children. And they're coming um, as a result of this program, which is a good program. It's an Islamic program. It's not just people getting together to eat, drink, and be merry, but it's really something a religious. Um, purpose. All these people are coming to the mosque, and things are happening as an extension of that. So women are coming for the program, and when we're here, they'll have let's have a halakha, or let's you know they'll do something constructive while they're here. And men too. Well, I'm here. I brought my children. I'm not going to go home and then come back. They'll sit and they'll read Quran, etc. So I think programs like these will bring the people. People they um, they genuinely in general they want to come. They want to benefit, they want to take advantage of the mosque, but they need something that is beneficial to them, that they think things benefits them. So I think that people who run uh, Masajid, they have to kind of, 
they have to kind of tap into that knowledge of what the people actually need. They can't be out of touch. You follow what I mean? That the people basically, they have needs that they want the mosque to serve. And the mosque can serve, can meet those needs. We just need to know what those, what those needs are. I think, um, and as, ext as an extension to what they're doing now with the Quran program, is maybe if they start a youth program. I know you guys are doing like a grassroots thing, but if it were more organized and was somehow connected to the mosque and the word got out, you could do some very um, good organized activities with a religious, um, you kind of like, it's social religious, so you kind of, it's a social thing, but we incorporate the religion in it. I think that a lot of people would be interested in that because people are concerned about their young people. And they don't have the specialized skills to, you know, train, teach, rein in. And parents feel helpless. Because it's for, for whatever reason, children will listen to others, but they won't listen to what? The parents. So you kind of need help. You know, that famous statement of Hillary Clinton. Um, I don't like Hillary. Don't like her at all. But I'm just saying she did say something which was true. She said it takes a village to raise a child. You need help. You follow that? And we don't have that help like we have back home. We don't have it here, but we can create it in the community. So I think that's another thing, like a, uh, an organized youth program. Um, um, you have the sheikh here. You have a couple of other people in the community. This is the sheikh is the problem, Mary. No, I don't think the sheikh is a problem. He's, he's, the, the, he's the solution. <laughs> but at any rate, like I said, you have the sheikh here. You have a few other knowledgeable people who could be incorporated to infuse religion. And you could have like some really good um, social programs what you're doing in addition to some other things, if you brainstorm. I myself, I have an Excel sheet of stuff that we were planning to do when I was in Peoria uh, for the youth and some things we did uh, with the youth. And so I think that's one thing we should do. I think that should be extended. Once you do something like that with boys, you should extend it to what? Girls. And there should be a good mother-daughter type program connected to the mosque, again, with religion infused in it. Like I said, I just think that there's certain services that the mosque could provide for the community that it doesn't, and that, draw, that causes people to feel like, you know, yeah, they tell us about Dean, but we have other needs and they don't address those. And it creates a type of um, love-hate relationship with the message, I think. And so that's something we should work on. You know, like I said, I mean, um, as far as the message, nobody can argue with the message. As far as the means and the approach, yeah, we're always open to the fact that, yeah, we might err. So tell us what the errors are and we'll, we'll address them. Does that, does that help, Hussein? That answer? Follow up, follow up, please. Like, tell them the, so. There are some uh, communities around the country that recognize the need to focus on the youth development and, and they go to the extent of even hiring like a youth director. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Because the, one of the, our problems is that we get people who will start, they will volunteer, and then they burn out. Yeah. A volunteer, and I think, I'm, to be honest with you, one of, one of the problems that Muslim communities face in general, especially communities on the Sunnah, let's just be frank, communities on the Sunnah, they, they struggle with resources. They just don't have the financial means to do some of the things that they need to do. Definitely to hire a full-time imam and to have, a, in addition to him, an assistant who what? will be like the youth can coordinate or take up some of these other responsibilities. Could be youth and could be other things as well. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something that we need because you almost need somebody dedicated to it and someone who, um, because like I said, the problem with volunteers is that they have their, their work life, their home life or whatever and ultimately those tend to um, push them out or they <coughs> become an obstacle to them uh, doing the work. So basically if you had somebody who was dedicated to that then they could definitely um, dedicate time, effort, and energy in creating a very good program for the youth and addressing some of those issues. So yeah, I, I agree with that. But again, the problem that we face is resources. The money that you would need to hire somebody full time to do something like that. Yeah. Tell them that is there any uh, anything wrong with uh, maybe three or four or five individuals from, say, this mosque mm -hmm. to form a delegation to go to other mosques and have a serious talk with the imams, mm -hmm. inviting them 
to unity, at least uh, for the time being, to show mm -hmm. unity, so to speak, uh, in, in occasions like Da'i, mm -hmm. because this is tremendous. I am one of the fortunate people. Uh, I lived in Virginia for 10 years, okay. and I used to uh, pray in D.C. Armory, for example. Mm -hmm. Mosques from Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Delaware, they used to come thousands. Mm -hmm. And the sight of it, by Allah, it gives you gray hair. Because we used to see the high-rise buildings all around D.C. Armory, the roofs are loaded with people, mm -hmm. Christians watching. So the, the gathering of the Muslims mm -hmm. in one spot is tremendous. In, in, in the impact, and this is also a, a, an opportunity for the, the Eid Khutbah to be about a subject that you yourself took on today, mm -hmm. which is extremism, uh, ignorance, and the need for knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that might spur... Uh, it, my question is, is there anything against three, four, five citizens volunteering to form a delegation going, say, to the other mosques in the area? Mm -hmm. Is that... Um, as far as like some of the particulars, should they form a delegation? Do, 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 I don't want to necessarily comment on the particulars or give a ruling on the particulars. What I would say is this, is that there's no harm if the mosques in general, the imams in general, the Muslims in general, they try to create an atmosphere of cooperation in good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, wa ta'awna al-bir wa ta'awna wa ta'awna al so basically he says, uh, cooperate with each other in righteousness and piety and do not cooperate in sin and transgression. So there's no harm if they want to foster this atmosphere of cooperation. If there's a good thing that we can do in cooperation with each other, we can keep the channel of communication open, there's no harm that they're still Muslims. <laughs> Nobody's saying that they're kuffar. At the same time, though, I think it's important um, that the people of truth, they have to call to the truth. They have to join good and forbid evil. And they can't take an attitude of, we're going to cooperate in the good things that, that we agree on. And then when it comes to things that we don't necessarily agree on, we're going to compromise, we're going to overlook, we're going to... That type of approach, it, what it does is it, it basically it removes a fundamental pillar of the deen, which is al-amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi al-munkar, commanding good and forbidding evil. So, or, or forbidding evil. So we can't do that. That's one thing that we can't do, and that's the fear when people start to talk that type of language. They talk to use that type of verbiage, uh, Ahmed, is that they say, well, we're gonna, we want to form a delegation, we want to call to apparent outward unity. Usually the motivation for that and the result of that is this attitude of, we cooperate in the good things we agree on. If we don't agree, we just agree to disagree. And we don't even bring that stuff up. We don't talk about that stuff. But then how can the truth be advanced? How can it be promoted? You follow what I'm saying? So if it's just a thing where they're saying, look, we just want to promote you know, cooperation, keep the channel lines, of, lines of communication open, because right now there's enmity, and so the people of truth can't even preach truth to these people because we don't have that relationship. If that's what they intend, then yeah. But if they intend something else, which is my fear that they may intend something else, uh, then they shouldn't, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't approach it like that. They have to understand that, look, there is a truth. There is one truth. And that truth has to be called to and everybody should be invited to it. The way we invite, you know, obviously we know all those rules, gentleness, you know, wisdom, knowledge, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it has to be called to. And so what we don't want to do is we don't want in a clandestine way, in a roundabout way, say that we're going to, we're not going to do that. We just want to get along. We just want to get along and we're not even going to talk about those things. That's what my, my fear is. So they, if people are thinking about this and they want to do something like this, you know, mashallah, but let them do it with that clear mind that we're not going to go and compromise. Wasim used a really good uh, word there, compromise the truth or abandon the truth just so, just so we can get along. You follow what I mean? Understand. Yeah. My point was to not to go to compromise. My point was to go to invite them 
to the unity which is to the rope of Allah and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad yes. to establish the evidence on them. Uh -huh. So the responsibility they will be responsible and, then. And that's that, that's awesome if if we do that. And even if we're not able, if, like I said, if, if if we're not able to convince them, we can still cooperate with them. There's no no harm in that either. But and, and this is what I meant by attracting them and like attracting mm -hmm. them to the truth. But we have to somehow get their attention first. You know? Yeah, and we can't just um, sit back and sit like we're, we have a monopoly on truth. And if people want truth, they should come to us. I don't agree with that approach at all. I don't. Yeah, we should reach out. We should call people. We should show that um, um, we do have a certain level of tolerance. I don't disagree with that. But I'm saying when we do that, we don't, we don't compromise. We don't compromise. We never compromise the truth. This like is the, the truth. For the, for the Eid Salat, the, I don't know the exact hadith, but wasn't it about showing the numbers and even the women that normally wouldn't come would be asked to come by Prophet I mean, there's no question. Like I said, this is, as far as praying the Eid together, there's no harm if the, there's no harm. And it could be, the it, it, yeah, it could be, it could be um, definitely in keeping with the Sunnah if the Muslims all came together and they prayed. And if they're able to do that without the people of truth having to compromise what they stand for. Because my fear is that, I'll give you an example. Um, suppose I go to another mosque, and in that, for that particular mosque, their understanding of the deen is that women don't have to cover. They don't have to cover at all. And women don't have to be segregated from men. They can mix freely with men. Some of them may go so far as to say that they can even mix in the lines of salat. Okay, so a woman could pray next to her husband for the Eid prayer. It's going to be very difficult for me, given my views on these issues, to where are we going to where are we going to find the middle? If I, a happy medium, something we can agree because if they're staunch that look, this is how we operate, and this is what we want, and I'm staunch that no, I don't want you know free mixing between men and women. I don't want women, you know, um, I don't know if there's anything to do about this about as far as women covering, because women will come and it won't be covered and there won't be much we could do about that. But you get the point that I'm trying to make is that if, if we have these this huge divide, you know, between what they understand to be the dean and what we understand to be the dean, then it's going to be hard to, to get to that middle. What's going to be, what's going to determine what the middle is? Like how, how did the other cities do it? Like what did you mm -hmm. see it more genius? And of course, the, the, the imams used to get together on a monthly basis. And uh, there was a call for all the mosques, even though some of them splintered from some other mosques. Like I witnessed in Pennsylvania during the 10 years I was there, it was only one mosque. Now there's four. Why? Because a group doesn't... <laughs> doesn't agree with, and it's all personal, basically. Uh, they all want to be holding the mic and yeah, they all want to be in the picture and all this. So they splinter and they go open their own. But it's obvious that the, the cit citizenry around, they're not close to that idea. So what they do is the community itself forces the imams to, to get together, which th there's where I see our role as members of this community or this mosque, I have no encumbrances. I mean, I'm open to pray anywhere yeah. because they're all the houses of Allah. However, if I see anything that is against the Sunnah, I can't keep quiet. I, yeah. I speak out. So what I'm trying to say is our role as citizens here, we should take it upon ourselves to be ambassadors, maybe, uh, we visit the other mosque every now and then, have a private talk with the imam, and then from there we should make the, create a ball that is going to rope. But Ahmed, his question specifically was, and my question as well, was that when you have, you have an issue where the imams are on opposite sides of the spectrum, we have to make them then aware. how do you resolve it, especially if one of them or both of them is adamant about their position. All we have to do is advise them for the sake of Allah yeah. and tell them. Okay. Remind them of the, 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 uh, the last khutbah of Prophet Muhammad
-hmm. And he said, I left for you. If you hold on to them, mm -hmm. you will never go astray. Yeah. yeah, but he says, yeah, this, he, but he might say this is the sunnah, according to him, but his interpretation of it, yeah. Well, show me the evidence. So bro. then, yeah, so that's what I'm saying, you kind of get to a, a back and forth. So that's the thing, I think the challenge that you face is that, you know, when you get to these issues where this imam is staunch on this position, this imam is staunch on a position which is the polar opposite, how are you going to resolve that? And and that's going to affect the ability for them just to cooperate in some of these things. So then there needs to be a third party who is objective and able to build a bridge between them if these two or three or however many men mm -hmm. are, have a, a real desire and realization to, to do that, to, to come to some point of, of, of agreement where they can work. It, sometimes it, it takes... A, an impartial person. Yeah, but who would be that person? They would all have to sign off on it. They would all have to agree that he's impartial. Yeah. You follow the citizens, the citizens. Yeah. The citizens of the community, they have to force the imams. But they have they... to direct the imams. They have to be the imam, and the imam becomes a follower. Right. So this is the only way. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a lot more complicated. I think the intention is good. But these are some of the hard questions you have to answer before you proceed. Because, I mean, mm. it's easy theoretically, on a theoretical level, to say, yeah, why don't we do this? But when you get to the practical level, and I've seen it play out in prison. I've seen it play out in prison where um, you think, well, you know, you can just come and say, well, there's something called Messiah, Yisubul Khilafu Fiha. Or Messiah, La Yisubul Khilafu Fiha. You, you think it's as simple as that, and try to explain that to them, that there are issues where it's permissible for Muslims to differ, issues where they're not permissible for them to differ. And no, permissible, not permissible, this is my position, and this is what I want everybody to comply with. And the other guy says, this is my position, I want, and they're polar opposites. Now what do you do? And it can lead... Um, Brother, if I come to you as an imam, uh -huh. and I ask you a question, and then you tell me the answer is... A, B, C. Mm -hmm. My follow-up question will be, can you show me the evidence? Uh -huh. So. But everybody, that's the thing, uh, Ahmed, if we look at um, Khilaf and this Ummah historically, everybody has evidence. People just don't say stuff. They don't. And, that, and Ibn Taymi, I think he was the one who said that um, people wouldn't follow Baltib if it didn't look like it was hot. If it wasn't mashubun bil haq, if it wasn't like mixed with haq, it, 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 you know, it, if it was just clearly bought, but people wouldn't follow it. And that's the thing that, you know, people, these madahib, um, they follow the way that they follow because it looks like it's true and there's some basis for it. There's some, some support for it. Now, we could start to dissect the support and say, oh, well, that hadith is weak, that hadith is fabricated, or you're misinterpreting it or whatever. But if they don't see it like that, that's the problem, making them see it the way we see it. That's where the khilaf comes from. It's not that people just want to follow falsehood. No, they think <coughs> the falsehood is truth, and they think they have a basis for it, and that's where the problem comes. So they're going to have their proof. Trust me, they're going to have their ducks in a row. And um, so like I said, I think on the surface of it, it sounds easy, but it's, it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult. And usually what happens in things like this is that the people who the people of truth, they're asked to compromise. And that's not right. Why would the people of, of truth compromise? Why would they compromise? But they're asked, they have to compromise. It's like in the situation like we just said. Women want to mix. We want them to mix. We don't see anything wrong with it. And they're staunch. We don't see anything wrong with it. So, so now, at that point, the people who say no, women and men shouldn't mix, and this is the truth, Either they have to do what? Compromise? Or like you said, they have to go their own way. So like I said, give it a try. But bear in mind um, what we said about not compromising and being, you know, uh, although you use a lot of wisdom and gentleness, you're still going to tell them that what? This is right, this is wrong. And then um, see what happens. But I said on a theoretical level, it sounds good. Yeah, we'll just talk about the deal and give me your deal. And yeah, it sounds good, but when you get into that situation, you'll see. You'll see it's not it's not it's not easy at all. People are not gonna 
They're, they're going to be adamant about their positions. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned something else which is important. I don't want to go on, you know, and I'm really sorry because you know, obviously this should have been over a long time ago, but I will say this, is you mentioned something really important. A lot of this stuff is personal. And so when a person, the personal is involved, nef the nefs is involved, people don't think straight. People don't even think straight. They don't think about the deen. I don't like Shigadi. I'm not going to say that. Me too. I'm not going to say that. No, I'm just giving you an example, right? So the person, they don't like him. They don't like him. If they don't like him, they're not going to say they don't like him. But the fact that they don't like him is going to cloud their judgment <coughs> and make them oppose him at every turn, even when he says the truth. They're still going to oppose. And we, we've seen this play out in, throughout history, and it plays out every day. And one good example is the famous Hadith of Sophia, where she talked about when she was a little girl, and her father and her uncle, who were two of the biggest rabbis in Al Medina, they go out because they hear about this prophet that they're expecting to come, has come. So they go out and they come back as if they came back from a funeral. And they sit on the, what we call the stoop, I guess, mm -hmm. of the house. Mm -hmm. And they don't say anything for a while because they're just like depressed. But one of them, he goes ultimately says, Ahua Hua. I just, I mean, you're the bigger rabbi. You know, I respect your knowledge. I mean, is, he, is, that, is that really him? I mean, from what I know, what I've studied, all the ducks are in a row, all the T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted. That's him, but what do you say? He said, that's him. Unfortunately, that's him. So he said, well, what are, what are we going to do now? And I mean, I'm asking you honestly, if you're a person of truth, why do you even ask? That question. But that shows you how, you know, obstinate they were against truth. So he said, so what are we going to do now? He said, we will fight him until there's no breath left in us, basically. And then the other example is the example of um, Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl on the plain of Badr, just before the battle's going to commence, he gets called over by one of his relatives. And he says, look, there's nobody standing here but you and me. Okay? I just want to ask you before we fight this man. Is he really a prophet? Is he really a messenger? So Abu Jahl says, he says, Weihak, ma jarrabna ala Muhammadin kadib al qat." He says, what's wrong with you, man? Have you lost your mind? Muhammad has never told a lie in his life. Well, you know he's a prophet. But we're going to fight him because he's from Beni Hashem. And if Beni Hashem has a prophet, how can we, how can we outdo that? We can't, we can't admit that they have a prophet because we've always competed with them. And when they gave water, we gave water. And when they did this, they gave Ijada, we gave Ijada. When they did this, we did it, we did it. Neck and neck. As far as trying to be what? The best tribe of Quraysh. The most noble tribe of Quraysh. Now they say, end of the Nabi. We have a prophet. Come on, we can't do that. We can't outdo that. So we have to fight him and act like he's not in order to keep what? Our shut off. Keep our, our nobility. This is a problem with people. That their love for themselves, their love for their group, they, their, and their hatred for others will blind their vision and cause them to reject truth. There's another obstacle you can have. Stumbling block. That people, just because of him, just because of his personality, they'll hate the truth that he calls to. That's another stumbling block you're going to have. Just think about that. But anything else you have for? You know, I'd like to make a small comment for those who try to reach to unity and all these things. You see, sometimes we talk about things in general. But I think it's wise that we take every case individual and they try to examine it. Mm -hmm. Because this is was the only mask here for at least 25 years, okay? When people came with different ideas, okay, they start here. Everybody who have a mask or used to have a mask, they grow here in this mask mm -hmm. with the same bad imam, the same teaching. They travel with them with different ideas. 
Somebody coming that I saw the dream and the prophet told me this and that and after six months he could not get through this solid wall, you understand? So he decided to open a mosque. So he can, you understand, make his zikr, his jumping, all this, whatever he wants, he can give his dreams. So he didn't go through. So as a result of this, he opened a different mosque. Mm -hmm. Okay? So when you don't know the history of why other people, who's not a personality, because those masks that exist in Columbia, South Carolina, they be, the people had started here first. Mm. They given the opportunity to give, exactly like you. I don't even know you before. You say you saw me 10, 15 years ago. I don't remember, mm -hmm. but I trust what you're saying. But I came, I heard you for one time. I give you the mic the next day. I say, hey, you can come give khutbah, you can give class. Okay, no problem. These people, the same thing. We give them the opportunity. You want to make halakha Quran, you can have Quran. You want to make Islamic school, you can have the floor upstairs. Everything. But because they came with a different ideology originally, you understand? They found that it's not easy to get through this Egyptian, African, guy, whatever you want to call it, okay? So with no way. So as a result of this, the only way they can breathe, you understand, and give their thoughts and their fabrication and innovation is to start something different. Mm -hmm. This one thing we have to take in consideration. There is nothing called, you understand, Iqamat al hujja Iqamat al hujja when a person is ignorant, he doesn't know anything, you understand? He did not try here. He didn't know what we're about, okay? But people already, they branch out of here. Now, who are you going to make the hujja? He doesn't agree with what you're teaching. So it's not a personality because I'm a person... Here, Brother Sabri, he gives a khutbah here. Brother Habib, he reads from Riyadh Salihin here. Okay? You yourself you give a khutbah here. So, the same way been given to the people. But they about a different personality. This one thing. The second thing that people have to take in consideration, okay, which I admire their sincerity, but being not aware, okay, you're going to make a big mistake and you're going to cause harm to the people of Sunnah. Why? Okay? Now when you go to talk to the Imam, this Imam is hired. He has his boss over him. And I mean it. I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay? This man is nothing except a worker. Alright? You do this, do that, teach this, don't teach this, this it. It's not like here. You understand? So now when you bring the citizen in the picture, okay, if you bring the citizen here, you're making a big damage because this is the last four, okay, for people of Sunnah. Now you think that you're going to try to do something good. This Imam is hired. His boss, who pay his salary, he's the man who sat with me 10 years ago telling me about all the dreams and the Prophet coming the, and, 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 and. And his boss, boss, is the person who cut the cake in the Christmas with the Pope or whatever, mm -hmm. and their mask is dedicated and registered under these people. People did not know. So you're making a two mistakes. One, people who branch out of here, not the personality, because we give them the member. You can give khutbah, you can make a school, you can, you can. But because the teaching that is here the, doesn't suit them. The second thing, you're going to talk to somebody who has no hawla, no kuwa, okay? He only a hired, okay? I'm not hired here, all right? I'm not hired here. Mm. So I don't have a boss here, you understand? Unless that I say something wrong, they can correct me, I have no problem. But those people are hired, okay? Whatever been said to them, they do it. So you talking with the wrong person. He could not do anything, mm -hmm. okay? He is the same person, the Imam leads them in Salah. He is the one, he make maulid with them. He's the same one, gives them the fatwa. So who you going, who you, you understand, we going in, 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 in uh, empty circle, you understand, or going around yourself. Yeah. So why you did not put your energy and 
try the time that you're going to put it outside, calling these people for unity. What's this unity you're talking about? Based on what? If it's based about Allah says, the Prophet says, the Sahaba understood, hey, come take the member. Come take the member. The member doesn't pay my salary. I'm not worried about it. I have a lot to do. So let the people come and even take over the, 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 the place, member, physically teaching. I'm not worried about it. But the people are not about it. So you have to learn from the mistakes of others. Do not start it again. Do not keep repeating it. Because after you get wounded, and now you understand that it's healing, and now you're going to scratch me again. Mm. Because you have a good intention, and you're in town, you don't know the history, you have a good intention, but now I'm going to get scratches all over my body. Now I have to go now and lay down in the bed for another two months, two years, to heal again and to get the community back again. Why? <coughs> what are we going to do? Why we don't make a unity in our mosque first? Eh. Look to all these children that got lost. We need unity here. Why you understand when you want to make a janazah, you could not even find enough people to wash a body? Why you want to understand that you want to make a da'wah day, share Islam day, you could not find <laughs> enough people to take a program that you take it once a year for three months? Why we always... Like I say, grass looks green from the other side. You have something here established since 1981. It say Allah said, the Prophet said, the Sahaba did. If the Imam says something wrong, come, I give you the mic and you can teach. Why not? Why you want to spend your dollar in something that is not worthy? Let's start unity here. Me and my wife keep fighting. And after this, we want to go fix the problem of neighbors. Why don't you understand me and my wife? So they sit down and talk about it. Try to understand. They have a unity in our house. And after this, try to see the problem of the people. They are not about it. This is the same people that you understand some of them that the woman doesn't need a head cover because her hair is her cover. Okay? This is the same people that their imam say, even if the hadith in Bukhari, if the hadith in Bukhari, the Imam did not understand it according to his ideology. This is the same people that I dealt with before. Oh, this Imam that in Colombia or South Carolina, I dealt with them. I know their ideology. I know what they're about. We are wasting our time under something called unity. What is this unity? Why ten people could not unite it? Why it have to be a thousand people? Let's unite it. Let's unite it. Why we could not take time, you understand, that we spend time with the youth. Oh, but we need all the youth of Colombia. It's not going to work, people. I, and maybe I'm not the most learned among you, but maybe I'm most the wise among you. Mm. Age, you understand, give you something, experience. Yeah. You see? So what I'm saying is those people who, mashallah, with good intention, I don't doubt anybody, but sometimes, like the dub, okay, that took the big rock to kill the fly, so he killed the fly that was disturbing his owner. But he doesn't want the fly to come in his face while he's sleeping and bother him. So every time the fly land down, he do like this, and the fly go away. Don't, okay. Finally, the dub, you understand, the bear got tired, he took a big rock, and when the fly came in the face of his owner, he threw it to kill the fly, not to disturb. His intention was good, but he killed the fly and killed his owner. Mm. Okay? So people, subhanAllah, anybody understand, come and tell me what is the problem with this mask? <clears throat> What's the problem with what teaching? Any mask out of this mask, prison, or past, it started from here. Why did they leave? Because this is not what they're about. So who are you talking to? Why you understand reinvent the wheel again? Why? For what? Can somebody sitting here have an answer? For unity. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> May Allah united our hearts. Yeah, the, no, the, the problem, Allah, if, if, you know, if you allow 
يا اخي تفضل تفضل شيخ ذا ذا اي ريمبر حديث اوف ذا بروفيت صلى الله عليه وسلم وي واز اسد انا دونت ريمبر ذا هول ثينج بس اي ثينك يو اند اي وي توكت اباوت ات ذا ذا كومبانيون كيم تو ذا بروفيت اند هي واز كومبلينينغ اباوت ا جروب ذات دي وير يو نو اكستريمست اند اند هي تولد ذا بروفيت صلى الله عليه وسلم ليس كيلد ات يو نو جيت ريد اوف ذس اند ذا بروفيت صلى الله عليه وسلم ريسبوند وي كانت Do you, do you remember the, the hadith and... and uh... I, what I remember along those lines is that they asked the Prophet, why don't you kill the Munafiqun? Mm. So they said, why don't you... You know who they are. Allah mm. revealed them to you. And they're a, a thorn in the side of the believers. They cause mm. all this mischief. So why don't you just kill them? Why don't you just wipe them out? So the Prophet responded, he said, لا يقالوا أن محمدا يقتل أصحابه. Yeah. yeah. So, so in, in, that, in that way, would we you know, consider some things that... Uh, We have to show wisdom dealing with with certain set, certain sect mm-hmm. of, of, of people the way how they understand and and also the patient which is you know mm-hmm. you know in the Quran you know mentioned you know in, in many places so if we as we see ourselves you know we follow the sun now we try to follow the sun now you know looking toward these people shouldn't we show some you know patience and find ways to bring them and mm-hmm. I mean we don't want to waste our times because you know you need to be concerned about your mm-hmm. own self. You know, I, you know, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, talks to the Prophet about that too. And he, yeah. you know, you know, go to the people that they're not listening to you and, you know, leaving the people who's really, right. you know, want the guidance. So, so you know, do not lose focus. And at the same time, uh, we don't want to be, you know, the, 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 the issue we were talking about. Don't be ignorant, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, uh, ignorance will, will come to it somehow, somewhere when we don't understand. Yeah. You know, so so uh, from that, I believe you know that wisdom should be there. You know, patience should be there, and uh, and don't do anything from your own. Yeah. You know, you gotta you gotta have uh, uh, as as brother Ahmed says. You know, what's your proof? Yeah. You know, otherwise we'll my, be like the monk. My uh, only hope, that's, that's my only hope, brother, of talking to the imams is maybe I understand the the sheikh's point that he's hired, and of course he's doing what. The superiors tell him. Yeah. However, my point is, if I speak one-on-one with him, maybe Allah will guide him to put his foot down and tell the people that they're asking him to commit bid'ah, mm-hmm. that this is an innovation. And Allah knows best. Well, I know as um, I've, I've experienced being an imam hired, that um, imams, they don't have a foot to put down, brother. Mm-hmm. They don't have a foot to put down. You can forget about that. When they deal with these lijan, when they deal with these boards, they're just at the mercy of these boards. It's, it's terrible. And um, it, just, it just depends. If you have a board which inclines t- toward the sunnah, then you may have more fortune with what you're talking about. But if you have a board that's just like, they don't care. They have, especially if you have a board which is their primary concern is populating the masjid. You know, they want people to come to the masjid. And they want people to put money in the collection box. Or people to donate generously to run the place. Then those, you can forget about the imam being put his foot down. I don't care what type of proof he gives, what type of, you know, con- convincing arguments he gives, what kind of admonition he gives. They'll just run roughshod over the imam. And they'll say, okay, that's all nice and good. Thank you for bringing your books and giving us this long speech and wasting our time. Now, this is what you're going to do. And I've seen it play out. I've seen it play out. I have friends. And I, like I said, I have my own experiences. So, yeah. I, th- 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 I think the Sheikh is right about that. So I think, I think it would be good if we can try to, same time like we try to reach out to the imams, that we try to reach to our members of our community. You understand? We need unity among the people of the mosque because if you are the foundation and you're going to go call other people, you understand? You have to have a strong foundation. We are not united. People come and keep talking about community. I keep telling them there is no community here. There is a mosque. Okay, people come pray and leave, pray and leave. Can we build a unity among ourselves? So let's understand, divide the job to two parts. Part is that we focus on the foundation. So when somebody else come, you will have a really strong foundation. Let's try to unite ourselves. We have people in the communities who did not have food. Nobody know about it. 
We have people in the communities who did not have a shelter or a house. What did we do about it? We have some people that been new Shahada for the last five, ten years. They don't know how to say the Fatiha correct. What did we do about it? You see, there is a lot of things can be done. You have about three to four, five hundred people coming, making Jum'ah. What did they do since ten years they've been coming and leaving? They don't have time. How you, who are you talking about making unity with? Can we try to educate these people? Can we try to understand to, to do something for them? Why it have to be massaging? Why could not be a unity among the masjid itself? What's wrong with this? Why we could not really care about our own family? We need unity in the family. We need unity in the mosque. We need to understand brotherhood among the brothers. You understand we need a sisterhood among the sisters. Like the brother was saying, they come drop their kids, they understand for the Quran, this is good. What we can do with all this 10, 15, 20 sisters outside? Mm -hmm. Can we come with something? Why we always looking too far? This big journey starts with one step, one mile. Try to walk, try to walk and take a step. So build your community, this is something very important. And I'm telling you, one day you will know this crazy guy or crazy imam, he really was thinking and using his brain sometimes, okay? They ask Juha, where is your ear? He said this. So what's wrong with this? Is this not your ear? Where is your ear? He said this. Wow, this is also my ear. But you have to go around all Washington, D.C. and Maryland. And you come down to Florida. And after this, you go to Myrtle Beach. And after this, come back, come to Columbia. You can come straight 95,000. And they say, why all this? Unity, unity, the mass get and abroad, da, 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 da. Where is the unity here among us? I tell you one thing. Okay, how many we are here? 10, 15, 20? Let one of you stand up and name the name of these people, okay? Let one of you, one person among you, stand up now and name the people sitting in this room. Go ahead. Go ahead, man. <laughs> you see? You got it, man. You see? This, this, so this it shows you that no, no unity. Even in one mask in one room. I may call the name of half of you. But, okay, let me try Muhammad Adli, Ahmed, Sabri, Isbah, Wali, Ahmed, and you belong to your father. <laughs> Rashid, you belong to your father. And Mustafa, okay, and Kasim, and Habib, and Abdullah. Okay? Don't try that. Because I could have done that. Bin Wasi. Bin Wasi. No, seriously, on the same weekend, we can have more than one project. Those who want to go to the other imams, so they can see what I'm saying, that is right, they can go, no problem. But the imam himself is the one who preaches the bid'ah, and he believes. Because do you know what? Those people who send this message, they smart. They made many, many, many interviews about who's the imam going to be in their, in their mosque. Because they build, they bought the property themselves. So it have to be imam like if I'm Pakistani or Indian or whatever, or Bangladesh, he's going to be a Bangladesh. He will talk and you understand, excuse me, Ahmed. Or he will, he will see me, you, you, Pakistani or Indian? Pakistan, okay. So let's talk about Indian. He's going to be an Indi Indian. He's going to be talking Urdu. And it have to be a Hanafi school. And I didn't say anything bad about Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmatullah. But it, so they have criteria, what he look like, okay? What he talk, what his school of thoughts, and what kind of uh, his uh, about sunnah or a little bit. Mm -hmm. He take authentic hadith or he can take any hadith. So they know, Akhi, you know who you're going to hire. So when you're going to talk to somebody, but I'm sorry, you it's in your time, man. We're all on the same page, Sheikh. You know, we, we all want the same thing, but can we do a little bit of all? Is this what I'm saying? Let's divide it, okay? 
Those people who want to go, they can go and do it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people there that I feel, you know, I feel bad for that, that are not even being exposed to the truth. Exactly. And, 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 and they had never been into this masjid. So that, that's the whole point. Like, what about them? Like, forget about the administration or the imam. <laughs> what about the people? Okay. <coughs> beautiful, beautiful people and the little kids in there. That, yeah. It's true, Akhi. So, mashallah, some people like yourself, okay, they were not stopping you to do this effort, Akhi. We are not stopping you. But do not go and tell them, I'm inviting you on behalf of Masjid al-Muslimin. You understand? This will be a big mistake because Masjid al-Muslimin is not inviting them. Okay? But can they come here? Of course. Can they celebrate Eid here? Of course. Can you understand? Do not pay the tuition, you understand, for Eid celebration and eat our food? Of course. We don't have a problem. Can they come and hear the khutbah? Of course. We don't have any problem, okay? Can they come, you understand, here with the shirwani and the thing and their stomach sticking outside? We can be patient for it for a couple of years. But like also, Brother, Brother Bilo was saying, like the, the, the abrasive, like how we put it, you know, the, that yeah. if we could be polished, you know, a little bit where we could be more approachable, that's... Yeah, I mean, wallahi, Wasim, I'm, I'm going to be honest with all you brothers, man. I'm, I'm open to that. I've lived that experience and I know we have a problem. And if you guys see that, you should speak out about it. If you see something, say something. Say something. <laughs> and people, regardless of their position, they have to be open-minded enough <clears throat> to recognize if that's a problem. Especially if people come and they're repeatedly saying the same thing. I, the, pro, I don't, the problem is not, I don't think anybody should leave this medjlis saying that the problem is the way. You know, the, the, the call, the da'wah, the methab, the, 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 the menhaj. That's not the issue. Now, the means, the approach. The yeah, personality. We could, yeah, we could, we, could, we could admit that that might be an issue. Once, once they see yeah. it, it will be beautiful. You know? Yeah, that's it. So like Once they get to know Sheikh Ali, they'll recognize his big yeah, picture. And he's <laughs> a nice guy. Don't worry, brother. Sheikh Ali is living And soon. I'm not praising him on his face. He's, 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 he's an awesome guy. He, has, he does a lot of good that people don't see whether it's people outside the mosque or inside the mosque. A lot of what he does goes unappreciated. But, you know, another thing too is, is that when you, when you have been in jihad for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, that's going to affect your personality. You know, he's a warrior, so he's going to be a little hard and he'll be a little rough around the edges. And that doesn't mean people, people should, but they won't. They won't give them a free pass. So, um, yeah, we can maybe work on, you know, some things as far as the approach. But as far as the message, it's... Because it's good. In, in the real world, it's, it's so far gone. Our kids have gone so far out there now. Yeah. And it, it's like we're not in the real world anymore. Yeah. It's just, uh, so, yeah, I mean, Please do something about it, inshallah, yeah. brother, okay? Let's work on it. And I delegate Brother Abdullah because he worked with youth before. Inshallah, you can have him and uh, whatever it is, inshallah, we'll try to work something. But I have no problem. Anybody come. And by the way, when I meet these imams any place, I give them a hug. I shake hands with them. I show them all kind of respect for your knowledge, all of them. The Bid'a one, and the Ikhwani one, and the Sunni one, and the Sufi one, I show them the, they're still Muslims, yeah. okay? I show them the best. And if they come here, it be janaza and happen for them to come, I, I give them all kind of respect. I never understand show any disrespect to anybody, okay? And they are welcome, and we can... And they know, you know, that all this masajid, at least representative out of them, they come every Ramadan, okay? They come here and breakfast with us, and I go serve them and take their plates and put it in their table. I, I, I do little stuff, I know, but I'm not stopping anybody, you understand, too. And we appreciate what you're doing with the youth, you understand? And we try to accommodate you, accommodate them, and try. we try. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a... I'm a human being, so you have to take me with my faults and my mistakes, and you have to be patient with me. But inshallah, it's a couple of months or a couple of years, Allah knows best, and 
So you need to prepare uh, for new imams, new administration, new this and that. So this is good that you get this opportunity to see what's going on. But alhamdulillah, the place is open. And alhamdulillah, any time you can come, you can pray, zuhr. You understand, even if you call it a school or you call it a masna or you call it a madrasa, okay? So these people who still have Jum'ah, but they did not allow people to come inside because they understand they switch it from a mosque when they want to do something to a school when they don't want to do something, okay? So you have two names, two jackets, two coats. I will meet you with one coat, and if you come, you understand, I will put a different jacket. I meet you with it, okay? So we change the colors. But here we don't change the colors, okay? We put it as is, all right? Our mask is open. Anybody can come and pray, can benefit from what is in the mask, but no one can come and teach in this mask unless I approve this person, okay? But they can use the property, they can bring the kids here, you understand, without breaking any uh, main Islamic rules, you understand? I don't mind. Everybody is everybody, welcome, even non-Muslims, okay? We can have patience with them, they work. But for somebody to come in this member, or somebody to get in front of this is mic, okay? I have to approve the person. Doesn't matter. I don't have a citizen in this issue. Is this is an issue? No citizen. And when the time comes that people are going to be my imam and I have to follow them because they are majority vote, I would rather to leave the mass, Colombia, even the United States. I don't compromise in my deen, okay? When it comes about the sunnah, I don't compromise. They said, Mike, member, open a book and teach you here. It has to be approved by me, not by the shura, not by majority. No citizen in this. You like it? Alhamdulillah. They don't like it, they can fire me. I'm not been hired yet, but so they can fire me. <laughs> <laughs> May Allah bless your day all, and I really appreciate this open discussion. Before you go, exactly. one, one question, one question. We're two months away from Ramadan. Yes. Three months away from Yudhu Fitr. Yes. We have the option to look at three or four locations for their eat. Mm. And I think now is a good time to start preparing for that. Yes. Whether you want to use uh, Martin Luther King Park, Sesame Centennial, the Masjid, Drew Park, or wherever. No, we need outside, brother. Sunnah Ferris. Sunnah Ferris. <laughs> so my question is, do you want to pursue, because it's going to be summertime and we might run into some complications using... Martin Luther King Park, although they said that they would be willing to shift their activities if had they known in advance. Do you want to look at that park or sesquicentennial to plan for the Eid? Both. Whichever one we can get. If, it is, if, what is it, if there's a preference. If I have something to contribute or to say, can I? Absolutely. Sis. Sesquicentennial? Sesquicentennial. Inshallah. I see, see. But that's going to require some, some. We know what we went through last yeah. year, and we plan in advance to <laughs> okay. okay. solve some of those problems that we had the logistics. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a good idea. Welcome back, brother Habib. You made it out. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. What time did you get back? Uh, just before Mark. Wow. To be here by six o'clock. Uh, glad you made it. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Okay.